Today on Blue 58, once again, the Packers are going to have a lot of options on the offensive line. How do those options fit together? It's going to depend a lot on individual performances. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Very happy to be with you here for another episode. Mentioned last time around uh, that we're looking for signups to our free substack so we can bring back polling for this year gotten quite a few already. We're over about 70 signups to this point. So head to thepowersweep.substack.com if you would like to to join in on that for this year. We're looking to get about 100 subscriptions there before we can commit to bringing polling back for this year. But uh, we're headed in the right direction. We've got a while to go before the start of the regular season. But head over and get that started if, uh, if you don't mind. Offensive line today. I always get a little nostalgic this time of year because we're just about to the point of year point of the year, the actual calendar year, when you start getting to football practice season. Just the other day, I noticed the the high school football team that practices across the street from where I live uh, was out in the morning for what I can only assume were were either the first of two-a-day practices or um, just some some morning conditioning type stuff in the the off-season here. But we're getting close to that time. And I always remember back to when I started playing football because the thing that I was most afraid of playing football growing up, the first season I played was not that I was going to get hurt or that I wasn't going to have a good time. Um, both, both of those things are probably going to happen if you play football. You're going to get a little dinged up and you're probably going to have fun if, if that's something that you want to do. The thing that I was most afraid of the first season I played football was that I was going to become an offensive lineman. Just didn't want to do it. The thing I really wanted to do was be a running back. And then after our first game, I was I was pretty convinced that I didn't ever want to be a running back because uh, the the Cedar Grove Broncos uh, took a trip down south to the next county over, and we played um, Grafton. And our running back, shout out to Joe Burton, who ended up becoming a, a really good high school running back, just got hammered every time we ran the football up the middle because Grafton had a bunch of big kids, and I was like. I'm seeing what Joe's going through. I'm not sure that's for me, but uh, I was glad that I, I was not on the offensive line tight. ended up being a good fit for me because of, well, just who I was as an athlete at that point. Um, but offensive line was always something I didn't want to do. And I think that was because of a lot of misunderstandings about what, what offensive line is like. And admittedly, it's probably not the most fun place to play in in youth football, but as a fan now, I have a great appreciation for offensive line play, and it checks a lot of boxes for me as a person who who talks and writes about football and just watches football. Uh, just We talk about this a lot with the, with the running game. There's a lot to offensive line play that kind of gets to that very earthy, primordial, like be stronger than the other guy sort of, football play. It's about moving the guy across from you where he doesn't want to go using strength and technique and stuff like that. And it's just very, it's old school football. You you can't get away from it. It's just the very nature of the game is expressed through offensive line play. It's, it's great stuff. Then you see a lot of great things with play design. You're learning, uh, if, if you dig into it, the difference between zone blocking and, and man blocking or gap blocking, power runs, inside zone, outside zone, there's a lot of stuff going on there that does not immediately reveal itself if you're not willing to put in the in the time. And, and a lot of that has to do with the, the teamwork aspect of it too. No offensive lineman is an island. Even in situations where you're going to put, say, a, a premier left tackle like David Bakhtiari in his heyday, kind of one-on-one with a pass rusher, that's a that's a, a play design choice oftentimes that a guy like Bakhtiari allows you to do. You're not doing that because that's what you prefer to do. You'd always love to get all of your linemen help if you can. But when you have a guy like Bakhtiari or some other top flight tackle, you can design blocking schemes in such a way that you take advantage of his skills by putting your resources elsewhere. It's all about that teamwork aspect and give and take. And it also shows on the offensive line that there are different ways to succeed. Bring up Bakhtiari again, even though he's not on the field or on the team anymore. But but looking at him as a player, he's you can see why people talked about him moving inside to guard early in his NFL career prior to, to the, the draft as a rookie because he was a little bit small for a tackle. And that never changed throughout his NFL career. He was always a little bit undersized, not quite ideal height 
definitely a little bit on the lighter side. But he succeeded as a tackle because he was very strong in other areas, a very cerebral player, a consummate technician, and he got the most out of the athleticism that he had, which was considerable. He was athletic for an offensive lineman, uh, regardless of his size. That's that's a, an interesting thing, and, and it's one of the, the best upsides to football is that there are there's no one way to – to be good or to succeed. You can have different body types and different playing styles and, and different techniques. And as long as you're getting the job done, you're going to have a job. And I think that's a really cool thing about, about the offensive line. And that leads into the roster building stuff because how all these different pieces fit together is going to determine what you have on the offensive line. And the Packers have that right now. They have a bunch of different interesting pieces. Uh, they've got a bunch of different individuals that I think is probably going to add up to another good offensive line this year. It's just what exactly that looks like is very much up in the air. I wrote about this earlier this offseason. I don't want to dive too much into the, you know, what does the starting offensive line look like? Because there's, I think there's a, a bunch of different configurations there. All of them make sense to one extent or another. The finished product is is something we're going to have to wait and see on. Right now, I just want to talk about the individuals. What who are going to make up uh, this offensive line group? Who who is going to be there this year? Right off the bat, three no expectations uh, players that I think were, were just kind of interesting lottery tickets: Lucita Smith and Donovan Jennings, two undrafted free agents uh, from this year. Smith, and in, in more interior player, a center guard or guard center prospect, uh, Donovan Jennings, a, a depth tackle prospect, might be the latest one in the pipeline as far as these developmental tackles the Packers have had around for a couple of years. We'll, we'll talk about them here in a second. And then you've got Kadeem, Kadeem Telfort, who is one of the undrafted free agents last year that I was most excited about and ended up sticking around in the practice squad. Uh, but he too is kind of in that pipeline of the, these big developmental tackles the Packers have had around for the past couple of years. Now heading into our low expectations group, that's basically where we start here. The first three guys in our discussion are uh, Caleb Jones, Luke Tenuta, and Travis Glover. Going to kind of go through these guys fairly quickly because I think they're just different versions of the same sort of players. First up, Caleb Jones. Been a project here for a couple of years after the Packers signed him as an undrafted free agent out of Indiana, and he continues to be a project. He hasn't really shown himself to be more than that, so I think we end up here in the low expectations area, but can't go as far as, as no because he, he's been around for so long. Because So now it's, it's kind of getting to that put-up-or-shut-up territory. It's time for you to go from project player to actual player here. So I think the bar for Jones this year is making it to the 53-man roster and uh, being an active participant uh, in the in, in the game day roster conversation. I think this is going to be it for him. I don't think he makes the roster this year. Maybe he's around on the practice squad, but I think the, the prediction for Caleb Jones, uh, no 53-man roster appearance initially this season. Luke Tenuta, I think, is in a similar boat. He's similar to Jones. He's been a project for the past couple of years. Last year, his progress was uh, derailed because of injury, he was back by the end of the year practicing, but wasn't the factor I think the Packers hoped that he would be. So similar to Jones, he just hasn't quite gotten there yet. I think he does make it to the 53-man roster. I think he's got a good shot, a real good shot. There is one change to the depth chart ahead of him. So I think I think he does make it to the 53-man roster, but that's going to have a lot to do with Travis Glover, a late-round pick this spring. And uh, I think the latest entry in the very big tackles that we're going to try to make into something project pipeline that the Packers have been running. You can throw Jones in there, Tenuta in there, Kandeem Telford in there, uh, Rashid Walker falls into that camp as well. The Packers have been throwing a lot of resources at getting big tackles, and Glover is probably the latest addition of that project. But low expectations just because of where he was as a player in, in college and where he is now. He's kind of without a defined position. There's been some talk of, of his inside-outside versatility. He did a little bit of that sort of thing in college. Not just tons, though. And so I think he's just got to hang around and get in the pipeline this year. I think he at least makes the practice squad this year. We, we might see him on the 53 at some point. But I think practice squad is a good goal for Glover for this year. And he doesn't have a whole lot of guys to hold off to get to that point. If you look at the Packers' uh, offensive line room composition right now, there's a lot of 
pretty well-established interior players. Um, Some guys like Rashid Walker and Zach Tom that have gotten a lot of opportunity on the outside, but the depth beyond that is not quite there yet. It's not, not established yet. We don't really know who that who that's going to be. So maybe maybe it is Glover, maybe it is Jones or Tenuta, maybe Kadeem Telford or Donovan Jennings makes a run here. Uh, but the things that tackle seem pretty, pretty wide open. Less so inside, and that brings us to Royce Newman, who I'm sticking way down in the low expectations group this year. Uh, the guy who started when they had nobody else is now in a danger of losing his roster spot pretty much because he started when the Packers had nobody else. So rewind back to 2021, the Packers had a bunch of injury issues on the offensive line, and Royce Newman consequently ends up playing more than 1,000 snaps in 2021. If you'd have said that heading into the 2021 season, that would have been a big surprise, I think, to pretty much everybody. In 2022 and 2023, the Packers apparently need a bunch of reasons not to play him because he is kind of their default option inside when they've got nothing else. And um, they end up getting kind of their their minds made up for them as they finally try other options there and they end up out playing him, Zach Tom being the the primary guy there who, who um, who, who pushes Royce Newman out here. Now in 2024... We're in a situation where, because of these performance escalators that have um, that the NFL and the, the NFLPA have put into uh, collective bargaining stuff, um, we're in a situation where Royce Newman, just because he played a lot in 2021, is now more expensive than he would otherwise be. Uh, it's not his fault. That's not the the contract that he's responsible for negotiating. That's just the rule. He gets this money now if he makes the roster. And now it's going to be harder for him to make the roster because he is expensive. If the Packers have a comparable option, why wouldn't they choose to save a little bit of money if they could, unless they're really convinced that Royce Newman heading into a contract year here is the answer. It's a bummer for him, but he might end up on waivers just because of that. Uh, Expectations, I think, are low then. Kind of unaffordable um, hasn't been great in extended opportunities, though it should be said he did improve down the stretch in 2021. You go back and look at his PFF grades for that year. His best graded games were coming toward the end of that season. And then as things sort of shook out with the, the rest of the guys on the roster, he got pushed to the wayside. That's not his fault. The, the Packers just wanted to go with different options there. Uh, but he he was improving down the stretch there. So here he is again, got to run the gauntlet. He's going to have to be, I think, exceptionally good for the Packers to to keep him around this year. I think my prediction is that he's going to be done in Green Bay, though the the cap number is is big, but the Packers aren't necessarily in a spot where they need to, to count every single one of their pennies, and that might be his saving grace. I do think he's going to be done in Green Bay because I think you've got a little bit of redundancy at some other positions here. Uh, specifically the first guy we're going to talk about in the moderate expectations group. But one more guy in our low expectations group here, Andre Dillard, veteran redundancy signing before the draft, signed very clearly so the Packers just weren't boxed into drafting a tackle if things didn't break their way. This is something I think we should give Brian Gutekunst a lot of credit for. He's adopted his adapted his approach over the past couple of years to, to hedging his best bets a little bit. Uh, You rewind to the 2020 draft, Uh, a big reason the Packers signed, or not signed, drafted, and then I suppose signed, uh, Jordan Love is because the receiver class broke differently than I think the Packers were expecting it to uh, in the first round. There was a big run on receivers basically between like 11 and 21, and all of a sudden everybody's gone, and there's nobody else on the the board that the Packers want, so they move up and, and get Jordan Love, and that ends up working out. But it happened again in the second round where guys went faster than the Packers could could get them, and they, they end up with A.J. Dillon in the second round, even though they wanted to move up for Chase Claypool among other targets there. But uh, Brian Gutekunst has done a better job of leaving himself out and, and giving himself some redundancy at positions where he knows he has a need, so he just makes sure that he, he doesn't absolutely have to get one. I thought we were going to see a signing like that with safety this uh, this spring. Then it ended up being the case, um, partly because they made a really, really big signing at safety. I thought we were going to get another one there uh, just to, to give them a little bit of depth at the position. But 
didn't end up needing to. Uh, Javon Bullard was there in the second round, and they they went from there. Got the other guys they wanted in in later rounds too. Uh, but Dillard was that redundancy signing heading into the draft, and I think uh, the Packers will will not need a lot of encouraging if they if they find another option they like better rather than go with Dillard. But I, I think you like the signing there because even though he hasn't had a high level NFL career, uh, he was after all a free agent in late April for a reason. Uh, he does have some starting experience, has some some connections to Matt Lafleur and the Tennessee Titans. Um, even though I, I don't think they 100% aligned, there may have been a year after Lafleur was there, but still, I think Lafleur, uh, his connections to that franchise do um, inform some some of his decision making. Uh, how could they not? You have you have people in that building who are connected to. Uh, but Dillard is has at least had starting experience in the NFL, is a good athlete, and the Packers were interested in him ahead of the draft a couple of years ago. So now he's here. How does he meet expectations? Hope uh, Make the roster, and then hopefully we don't see you from there. Ideally, Dillard is going to be a depth piece at tackle, probably not playing ex- extended snaps, hopefully not playing extended snaps, especially considering you've got two guys you like as your nominal starters right now in Rasheed Walker and Zach Tom. And then a first round pick behind those guys, hopefully as your top backup. So if Dillard does make the roster, hopefully we're not seeing him. Uh, if he if he doesn't make the roster, it'll because the it'll be because the Packers feel good about an additional young player, maybe Luke Tenuta, Donovan Jennings, uh, Travis Glover, who knows, um, as, as one of their depth pieces that they have under contract control for longer. I think he does end up making it because the tackle depth is just so uncertain right now. I like the options. I think the Packers have a lot of them, and having a lot of options is is their greatest strength in the offensive line right now, more so than even the individual talent of any one player. And there are some talented players on this offensive line group. But I think just with the uncertainty of of tackle depth right now, I think the Packers will default to trusting in the veteran. Is that a good idea? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we have a good enough read on how how Dillard may compare to some of these depth pieces at tackle right now, but I think he does make it just because of that sort of uncertainty. Now into the moderate expectations group. We've got four guys in this group, starting with Jacob Monk, one of the more exciting rookies in this year's class, just because uh, he's got some significant versatility at a position where the Packers do have some depth issues and, and some questions here too. But three position versatility inside, both guard spots, and I think he could play center. And he aligns with a need the Packers have, if not in the long term, certain, or if not in the short term, certainly in the long term. The Packers are going to need a center next year at some point in some form, either re-signing Josh Myers, which seems unlikely, or handing it over to a new center, maybe Zach Tom, maybe Jacob Monk. And in the meantime, you still have right guard, which is hardly settled at this point. So I think Monk really aligns with a lot of those things. And I'm, I'm putting him in the moderate expectations uh, piece accordingly, uh, partly because he could have a lot of variation in what we end up seeing from him this year. He could end up being just a depth piece. He could end up starting games for the Packers here, depending on how he performs and other players around him perform and, and just what the Packers think of him in general. So the expectations for Monk here are, are going to be met if he's just ready. Uh, a lot of these guys are kind of in uh, hurry up and wait mode at a lot of different positions. They got to wait for things to say, shake out ahead of them. Monk is in that camp. He's got to wait and see what happens with uh, with guard and center prospects ahead of him, and that will determine what ends up being his final role for the Packers this year. Prediction wise, I think he's going to end up starting a game for the Packers this year. That's a day three pick, uh, starting games for you. But I think he he just aligns so well with what the Packers need. So if it's Josh Myers getting hurt or maybe uh, Sean Ryan getting hurt or faltering at some point, uh, I think Monk is going to get the nod. Then you've got Sean Ryan, who I think is a nice counterpart to Monk in this discussion. Been a rocky couple of years for for Ryan, too, the former third-round pick. Now it is uh, put-up-or-shut-up time. We are heading into year three here, and he's been basically handed a golden opportunity, though not without some threats and competition there, too. But the Packers seem to be pretty clear on him being the presumptive starter at right guard for the time being. He's getting first crack at it, if nothing else, uh, after the departure of, of John Runyon after the Packers don't really add another significant guard prospect here, although I, I suppose you could say Jacob Morgan or, or Jordan Morgan, excuse me, uh, is a is a potential guard prospect there. Um, but he's, he's not 
Morgan is not there yet. Uh, Ryan is still going to be the guy making uh, making moves at at right guard for right now. So, mat- moderate expectations though. I think if you're looking at the starting offensive line right now, the Packers' attention is going to be mainly focused elsewhere. You've got three spots I think locked up: left guard, center, and right tackle are going to be Elton Jenkins, Josh Myers, and Zach Tom, unless something unusual happens there. But the bulk of the attention goes to left tackle and right guard. Um, and I think guard is probably not not going to be it, not going to be the primary area of competition right away. I think you're looking primarily at left tackle. If Rasheed Walker falters there and Jacob Morgan can step in, I think that's that problem settled. Then you might turn to right guard and say, okay, what can we do there? Well, if Morgan is starting at left tackle, which is where I think the Packers would prefer him to be, Ryan probably ends up winning right guard by default because I don't think the Packers want to move Zach Tom out of right tackle into right guard. Said we weren't going to talk about offensive line configurations here. You can't really avoid it when talking about Sean Ryan. Suffice it to say, he's not going to be like the main guy under the microscope. He is competing for uh, playing time and opportunities here, but he's not going to be the primary focus of these competitions. The variance here, like Monk, is pretty big. He could be a starter. He could end up being phased out. Again, a pretty big variance. I think he meets that challenge by just holding off the challengers for right now. If the Packers want to look at some long-term options after that, well, so be it. We may see another timeshare sort of situation down the stretch as the Packers try to figure out what they really want at right guard. But I think uh, Ryan is going to be safe in the very, very short term. I think he's going to start at least eight games so far this year, and I'd even go so far as predicting that he's, he doesn't see a serious challenge until at least November. He's going to start every game through November um, and and be in that sort of nominal starter phase until the Packers kind of stabilize here early in the season, which is something every team has to go through. Rasheed Walker, up next, unexpected bright spot for the Packers last year. The biggest success story of the essentially red shirt to giant lineman program over the past couple of years. The Packers have been in that in that phase where they've uh, tried out a bunch of guys that are enormous. Uh, Jones, Tenuta, Walker, uh, throw Andre Dillard in there. Uh, Kadeem Telfort, we've said it a couple times now, you get it. Uh, but Walker, by far the biggest success story, except now he's got to do it all over again. David Bakhtiari goes down last year. Rashid Walker gets first crack at being his replacement. He holds off an in-season competition from Yash Nyman to become the unquestioned starter down the stretch. And what do the Packers do to re- reward Rashid Walker? They say some really nice things about him, and then they draft an offensive tackle in the first round. That's life for a late-round pick. Just always got to be winning your spot. And that's where Rashid Walker is. So trying to temper expectations a little bit for him. It would be great for him to repeat that success. The Packers are kind of betting on him not repeating with what they've done in the offensive line to this point. They said, we don't want Zach Tom moving inside. We want him to hold down one spot. We're not going to consider him at left left tackle, but we're going to introduce some competition through some other guys. And we're going to sign a veteran free agent too, in case both of them aren't ready to go in Andre Dillard. I think he's just got to be the best Rasheed Walker he can be. If the Packers don't want that, so be it. But he's got to do everything that he can to control uh, the narrative and the decision-making just by being, again, the best Rasheed Walker. Like Ryan, I think it's going to be early season Rasheed Walker for the Packers. Uh, I think the Packers would prefer to see Morgan win out there at left tackle, but I think Walker locks it down. And like Ryan, I think he's the unquestioned starter through October as well. After that, We'll see. You never know how things end up changing. Then Jordan Morgan. I can't put him in the high expectations group just because of what the offensive line looks like, the overall geography of the position. There's a lot of uncertainty, and the Packers didn't draft him because they needed him to start right away. If it takes him half a season or a full season to find his exact role with the Packers, I think they're fine with that. To be clear, I do think they want him to start long term. He wouldn't draft him in the first round otherwise, but they... I don't think are in a hurry with Jordan Morgan. But I I like the bet for the Packers this spring. It never hurts to have more offensive line depth. And if you're going to do that, you might as well bet on a premium athlete with positional versatility. Morgan is a good athlete with pos- positional versatility. They think he can play four positions. I don't think there's any reason to bet against the Packers' assessment on that, considering how much they've moved offensive linemen around throughout the Matt LaFleur era. So Morgan seems like a pretty good bet to be one of their success stories moving guys around. Moderate expectations, though. Has all the tools, 
what will he get as far as opportunities? He is not the only option or even the primary option, even as a backup at any of the four positions they want him to play. If the Packers are playing a game tomorrow, I don't think if Morgan starts for sure, but say Rashid Walker goes down, I don't think Jordan Morgan gets the call there. If Sean Ryan goes down, I think it's probably Royce Newman that that they slot in there. Morgan could do it, but I don't think he'd be their first choice. So I think looking at what we want from Morgan this year, I think he's got to just make it a real competition for both Rashid Walker and for Sean Ryan. That's all the Packers are looking for, and I think that's what we should look for as well. And I think Morgan is going to end up in the starting lineup at some point this year. I think he starts at least three games this year, but I don't think the Packers are looking for him to be a primary starter at any position. I do think he starts a game. I don't think it's going to be a lot of games. High expectations. I, I kind of like putting these guys at the end because I have the least to say about them. Uh, everyone knows who the high expectations guys should be. Um, and sometimes it's not even their fault that they end up in that camp. In a normal circumstance, I think Josh Myers, the first guy that we got to talk about here, should probably be on the lower end of moderate expectations. We've seen how he plays. We've seen the, the struggles that he has from time to time. And yet, the Packers have gone out of their way to both protect him and prop him up at every turn. Every time they have the opportunity to talk about what they think of Josh Myers, they say what a great player he is, you know, how he's succeeded, playing the best football of his, his career. Uh, it's, they all but give him the key to the city every time they, they talk about him. And I think that's just a little bit weird. Why so precious about Josh Myers? I mean, maybe they have a radically different assessment of him than what seems to be the, the common fans' understanding, and that could be. Maybe they're right, even. But it, it just it's, it's a little bit strange to me the extent to which the Packers go to defend Josh Myers. And I think we have to have accordingly high expectations. Through no fault of Josh Myers, again, the Packers have not missed an opportunity to, to prop him up ever since people started talking about Myers maybe not being the answer at center. Which kind of <laughs> prompts the question, if he's so great, why do you have to keep telling everybody how great he is? I don't know. It's just a strange, strange sort of thing. I don't even know what he does to meet high expectations this year. What would he have to do to be someone you feel like, oh yeah, he is as good as the Packers have said that he is. I guess just that. He's got to be that kind of guy. But maybe just this uh, for Myers, he, in addition to having all these expectations from the Packers, has a lot on the line for himself this year. He's heading into free agency next offseason. And I know centers don't make the most money in the offensive line, but this is his chance to cash in. So if he is the Packers wire-to-wire starter at center and has a good season, it could be a financial windfall for him. I don't think he's going to face any real competition at center this year. I think the Packers would prefer, even if they're looking at a guy like Jacob Monk or, or whoever, Zach Tom at center long term, they're just going to let this season play out and then have that conversation next off season, whatever that conversation ends up being. So I think he's going to be a, the wire to wire starter this year and face no real competition at center. Real quick, the, the final two guys here shouldn't be a big surprise. You've got Zach Tom and then Elton Jenkins. We don't have a lot to say about either of these two guys. We know what they are as players. We know what they can do. And we don't, the Packers are counting on them to be what they've been to this point. That's basically it for both guys. To dig a little bit deeper, we're in the process uh, among my colleagues at AgnePackingCompany.com of putting together a series on the, the top 25 players on the Packers. And of the people who submitted ballots, I think we got six or eight people who voted in this thing. Uh, almost everybody, I think everybody had Zach Tom in their top five, some in their top three. Some people had him as the best player on the Packers. I didn't quite go so so far as to say he's the best player on the Packers. Personally, I think Rashawn Gary is my my number one player on the Packers right now, but I'm willing to have that conversation. It's not something I, I hold super dearly. If you think Zach Tom is the best player on the Packers, I, I wouldn't argue with you all that much. He might be their best offensive lineman. In fact, I think he probably is their best offensive lineman right now. And we'll talk about why here in a second. Uh, but he, he plays a valuable position. Uh, he's played well, and he's shown to be versatile. He's just got to continue to be that in 2024, whatever year this is. 
The Packers, again, are going to have three positions with no real competition, left guard, center, and right tackle. So if he locks down that job, he'll have done his job for this year. If you don't make the Packers regret in any way playing you at right tackle, and why would he, um, they'll be in fine shape. And I'm going to go so far as to predict that Zach Tom has a Pro Bowl season this year. And then Elton Jenkins. We all know Elton Jenkins. We love Elton Jenkins. He is Zach Tom with a real big contract, and that bumps up the expectations for what he is going to bring this year. We've seen what he can do. Unfortunately, he hasn't been quite as good post-ACL as he was pre-ACL. To meet expectations, to live up to that contract, he's got to be basically playing at a Pro Bowl or All-Pro level. And he hasn't quite been there for a year and a half, maybe, season and a half. Some of that was excusable, I think, in 2022, coming back from the injury. A uh, little bit of positional uncertainty there. We're not quite there yet. We were not quite there in 2023. He was not as good as he can be. And uh, certainly, I don't think as, as good as his contract would require him to be. If run the numbers on this. It's not worth breaking down, the, the reading out the numbers to you. Uh, but his his play, at least if you trust PFF grades, maybe you do, maybe you don't, has been not quite as good post-ACL as pre-ACL. On average, um, he's just a little bit below where he was pre-ACL. You see fewer elite performances from Elton Jenkins, too. I think he can still be a valuable long-term piece. And if he's just holding down left guard at an above-average starter level, I think that's where that that's good. It may not be living up to the contract, but it's still a very valuable piece to have. My big prediction for Ellen Jenkins would that would be that his season-long pro football focus grade will be in line with his 2023 game, plus or minus two points. Not necessarily bad, not necessarily what, where he was pre-ACL, and potentially not worth that contract. That doesn't bother me. Basically, what the Packers have decided is they'd rather have Elton Jenkins than not have him, and they were betting on him to, to be um, at least close to where he was pre-ACL injury. And I, th- I think he's been close, but not not at that level. But I think he can be close. It's just I think the, the chances for big strides at this point are, are diminishing a little bit. I, I'm less high on him post-ACL, now two years removed, than I was a year removed. I'm less optimistic of him being as good as he was pre-ACL. But still a very good offensive lineman and should be a fixture on the Packers' offensive line this season and seasons to come. That's all I've got for you on the offensive line, and that's all I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. I'd appreciate it even more if you'd take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. It's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.